Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and today's video is brought to you by our good old friends at Raycon, ladies and gentlemen. Something I've learned making videos regarding programming, Linux, virus investigations, even the deep web, or just the random stupid stuff I find on the internet, is that as you're editing it, as you're researching it, as you're sitting down and programming and chipping away, and tinkering with things that almost cause you to pull your hair out, you really need to have 32 hours of wireless audio, premium quality wireless audio, running through your ears, whether that's a chill, relaxing synth wave sound or even a podcast you're trying to catch up on raycon are your homies because they come with gel tips for the comfort for those long sessions and unlike other brands they don't even stick out of your ears and you get that good old-fashioned premium audio for half the price of other competition and let others hear your premium voice through the built-in microphone and you know what? They sound just as good. And if you don't believe me, well, ladies and gentlemen, Raycon is deciding to hit you up with a 45-day happiness guaranteed. You're going to have a big smile on your face or your money back. So don't just take my word for it. Ladies and gentlemen, go to the link in the description box or go to buyraycon.com slash someordinarygamers and save up to 20% off your next Raycon purchase. Haha! <laughs> How's it all going, ladies and gentlemen? Today we're gonna have an epic video. A couple days ago in the SOG Cinematic Universe, I ended up saying I was gonna game on a Mac. Now, a few people came out and said, Haha, Muda's just kidding around. Of course he wouldn't say that, Muda and Mac Gaming. Muda and Macs in general. Yes, I wasn't joking. I ended up making a $5,500 commitment to joining the world of Mac Gaming. To give you some historical context, I ended up purchasing a Mac, okay? I did it. I went down that road. Frankly, I've been trying to cut down my Windows usage, and I switched to the other tumor in the operating system department, Mac. Mostly because I only use it to edit some videos, edit the videos that I have for my channel, and just do creative work, okay? It's a great solid device for it. It's Unix-based, meaning that I don't have to pull teeth with Windows 11 crashing every goddamn time I use any editing software whatsoever. Literally, the only time I touch Windows 11 is to play Rainbow Six Siege. If I don't don't play any Ubisoft games, I don't use Microsoft Windows. I'm a Linux kind of guy. And Mac is as close to Linux as we're going to get. It's a Unix-based system, super solid, super stable. I can work on it for like hours on end. Some of my largest videos, like the Rubet House of Card series, Shenmue, Cyberpunk, all done completely on a Mac. And you might be wondering, but Muda, why? Well, again, stability is key in this situation. And last time we looked into a Mac, I looked at the M1 processor Mac. This is the only reason I'm actually ever interested in this. I like being at that sort of cusp of technology. And finally, now that Apple is building all of their own hardware, I have to get a Mac. I've been using a Hackintosh virtual machine for basically over two years now. And ever since Apple has dropped Intel as their like chip maker, now that they're building their own thing, the days of Hackintoshing are coming to a slow, steady end. So you kind of have to pony up the cash for Apple regardless. And if they're building around the hardware, and if it turns out to be good, then I can I can pay the Apple tax, okay? I, it's not going to feel too good, but I'll take the financial fisting. So to understand, today's video is all about going to the highest end of Apple Mac devices. So if you go to their actual website over here, it's a, a jolly holiday season. We're only interested in the Mac. So if you go to the Mac here real quick to really explain what's happening, if you just check what they're actually selling in their department. On the desktop front, they have a couple M1 chips. M1 chips, and somehow they're still selling the Intel Core stuff, for a few years at least. Now, all these Intel Core stuff has not been updated, okay? Apple has not updated any of this. This is still old shit just lying around. Basically, they're clearing the inventory and whatever contractual obligations they have. If you go to the notebook section, they've got the M1 chip, the M1 chip, and if you pay super extra, you get the M1 Pro, but we went with the M1 Max. We went with an M1 Max Mac. Say that 10 times fast, buckos. So yes, it starts from $2,499. So again, the configuration that I got was the Apple M1 with 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU, and a 16 core neural engine. Ooh, 64 gigs of memory. And I stuck around with one terabyte of storage because no way was I fucking dumb enough. I mean, I'm already dumb, but no way am I that that dumb that I'm paying 2750 bucks for 8 terabytes of SSD store. Actually, is that a bad price? I And uh, did I pay for Final Cut Pro? No. All right, I did not. 
Oh, they're going to give me Apple TV for three months free? Yeah, with a price tag like that? No shit, I should be getting Apple TV Plus? Get out of here. Anyways, after tax, it ended up being somewhere around $5,500. So, let's get the good positives out of the way, okay? Let's get the boring stuff out. First off, the laptop, very premium feeling, okay? It's a heavy chonky boy compared to the previous mac m1 that i had this thing actually has a lot of weight to it all right that thing felt like a newborn this feels like a newborn three years later okay it's heavier it's got much more pizzazz in it and frankly it's getting to be a lot more smarter than when it first came out of the womb now m1 max over here it's got a pretty stellar battery life for being an actual chonky laptop battery life on these things are pretty decent according to their own website you if you get the cheapest model they get you like 18 hours and then you get to 20 hours and 21 hours. Now, I have never gone up to 21 hours on the system. I'm sure this is like the most optimal battery configuration. So it's like, unless you're like just watching a video or like browsing Reddit, maybe you'll get 21 hours. You probably will. But if you're doing anything like pro, like video editing or even gaming, it'll probably go down to like maybe 14 to 15 hours. And that's not bad. Like if you're playing something like Grand Theft Auto Online, which is totally doable on this actual device, if you go through a couple hoops and hurdles, which we'll all get to. And that might actually be better than most of the gaming laptops you see that die within 30 minutes. However, the performance on those laptops are way better than what you'd be getting here. But again, let's get into all of it. They're good pieces of hardware. They're just really not meant for portability. Whereas this thing will last and it literally didn't get hot. We're talking lukewarm. Apparently this thing has fans in it. Mine apparently don't seem to kick up. I had to download like third party software to test to see if the fans weren't even defective. Oh, they work. They just don't really kick up ever. Now, the reason why this excites me is this is an ARM-based processor. For those of you who don't understand, most of the desktop processors or laptop processors that you're using right now are x86 64-based processors. They're good, they're dominant, they're where the market is right now. But the ARM processors are processors that have existed in our cell phones, our tablets, some of our gaming devices like the Nintendo Switch, and now most notably, professional tier laptops, which is a pretty big deal. A lot of big companies are spending billions of dollars putting money into ARM, whether that's to avoid contractual obligations with Intel and everyone else, or to push technology they consider to be better, is certainly interesting indeed. This is, this is where we are headed to in some slight way. There's a divergence happening of processors, okay? You've got AMD destroying Intel. You've got Apple coming out of nowhere, destroying Intel. You've got every other processor manufacturer coming out, destroying Intel. You've got Intel basically kind of getting up and pushing themselves out there. So so it's really a competitive market at this point in time. So really with this laptop, you're getting a lot of power efficiency and you're actually getting a pretty decently fast system. But what are the downgrades? We'll get to that in a bit. So something that's rather interesting in Apple's entire stuff is the actual benchmarks that they're providing. So for instance, if you go all the way down over here, if you look at their actual SSD speed, this might be one of the fastest SSDs that I've gotten my hands onto. And a lot of that is benefited from the unified like systems that they have. Their thermal control isn't a joke. It's an ARM processor and they're definitely cooling it down the best way that they can. One of the little mini rants I wanna go on is every time you look at any company showing you benchmarks like this, like Apple's telling you, ah, look at our efficiency versus high-end PC generic. Every tech manufacturer does this shit and it drives me insane because you never really have access to like what benchmarks they're doing, how they're putting it, what kind of optimal setting they're going for. Really these benchmarks are a nice way to sort of guide your thinking, but you're really never going to know anything until like a real world example is shown, all right? Until you actually start using this thing like an actual human would do, which is sort of the basis I want to go with in this video. There's plenty of stuff online on the internet you can find of people looking through you know this system and running the highest end games on it or whatever but I'm trying to run the video games that I normally would typically play and seeing how things go from there I don't cover everything obviously but I cover enough to really gauge an idea of the gaming performance and really how you're able to stretch your legs on this device when it comes to high-end PC software okay that's pretty much what it comes down to 
So to understand, if you do things like video editing, I've run some of my big projects like Save the Kids recently, uh, the Rubet House of Cards series, uh, Shenmue. In fact, Cyberpunk's downgrading, which had a lot of assets and a lot of After Effects work on it, was actually something I threw into this laptop, and immediately I was blown away. It rendered everything pretty fast. It actually rendered things better than my system. When my, my actual workstation, when I finally got things running entirely on the SSD and within the Apple hardware, it was all beautiful. It all ran like gravy. Then I remembered to myself, it's a $5,000 system. If it can't rip through renders, I got scammed because this quite possibly is the best configuration from Apple's hardware that you can get right now. All right. Granted, if you, I didn't pay for the extra hard drive space, but this is without a doubt the best hardware that you're going to get from their site. I paid the extra premium. So if it wasn't able to do the only thing that I bought it for at very good reasonable speeds, what's going on? I got scammed, but frankly, I did not, okay? Apple, frankly, they kept themselves up to snuff. And a big chunk of that is finally, a lot of the software that you use for creative work has actually been ported natively to their hardware. You can actually see this by how certain pieces of software are actually reported underneath Apple's task managers. So you can see over here that Intel and OBS is exactly the software that you would expect. It, OBS hasn't ported its software over to the M1, but any software that runs on the M1 actually is designated with the Apple kind over Intel. So a lot of software, if you scroll through the list, runs natively under M1, which was obviously far different than way back in the day when these processors first launched. You know, developers are finally on board, they're programming for this architecture, and in turn, getting better results than originally running underneath Rosetta 2 or their translation layers. And this is pretty awesome. So then I started to do some programming and I started to, you know, basically compile things like the Muda phone and a couple web applications and a couple emulators from open source scratch. And again, I was blown away by the performance. This thing holds its own. Of course, for $5,000, you should be able to program pretty well on a Mac system, okay? Firing up virtual machines and Docker containers were relatively easy, having a good time. This thing stood its own. But I know why you're here for the video, but Muya, can it game? Oh, uh, no, kind of, maybe. I mean, we'll try. So first off, I wanna break this video down by the games that I played, okay? I know there's a bunch of benchmark videos out on the internet, but frankly, this is my experience, and I wanted to really load up the games that I would necessarily play. Indie games, some AAA stuff, some really high demanding stuff, and the results were incredibly mixed. So I guess the best way to go down is to really dictate like the, the, the sort of like experience you'll be getting depending on how far and how willing you're going to run certain games. So the first step is native games. There's a few actual native games for M1. Honorable mentions are games from the Apple Arcade, okay? Yeah, before I show you anything on that Steam side, I just want to mention the Apple Arcade, where this is where Apple wants for gaming right now, it seems. So this is the arcade, you get like 180 ad-free games, it's kind of like Game Pass, if you will, and if you look through the games, they've just got like bangers on bangers, boys, they've got some Master Chef Let's Cook, I know that I bought a five grand Mac just to play this, and then you've also got other titles like, ah, let's get ready for Angry Birds Reloaded, classic slingshot action. Now, of course, I could continue to be the prick that I am right now, but there's also games with really gorgeous graphics like, uh, what is it? NBA 2K22 Arcade Edition. So again, a like sing like a mobile version of the game when they could have probably gotten the actual core like PC version of the game out there. And of course, the more and more you go down, they've even got games optimized for M1. So if you look at these games right here, this is what Apple really wants to push. For instance, Castlevania Grimoire of Souls. Yes, this gotcha style piece of shit works just fine on your M1 Mac. Don't, don't get too excited though, because this is peak gaming right here. Yeah, at this point, you might as well just quit this entire bullshit and just go right back to Steam. The only decent game in this entire list that I've seen so far is probably Manifold Garden, okay? If you haven't played this game, it's probably up there with something like Anti-Chamber, but that's about it. Let's go back to something much more tolerable. 
Now, there are actual iOS games like COD Mobile and whatnot that you can download on your phone, but you can't download on your laptop. And that's because the developers do not allow you to play those games on your MacBook, but they'll allow you to play it on your iPhone, despite the hardware effectively being the same, okay, between the two. There's literally components built into this hardware to run those iPhone apps natively. So really, the developers are the only ones screwing Mac gamers out of the actual gaming experience. So the other big example for this is Divinity Original Sin 2. If you don't know, if you have an iPad with an M1 chip in it, you can literally buy Divinity for that iPad and play it at 60 frames with really good graphics. Now, that same game will not work on an M1 MacBook because the developers have not allowed that application to be released. Yes, you can sideload these applications, but in certain cases, if you're playing online games like COD Mobile on a MacBook, you can actually get your account banned. I've shown that last time I covered this, so it's a weird hodgepodge to get into. As far as Mac gaming goes, there's native games that you can download and play to your heart's content. Not a lot, but they're there. The other ones are Mac games that aren't native to M1. So basically, the Intel Macs can run all these x86 versions of Mac games. Games like Deus Ex, Mankind Divided, Hitman, Borderlands, anything that was high profile and released with a Mac port. These run through Rosetta 2, and they run with pretty good frame rates. Now, this is Deus Ex, Mankind Divided. This is one of the most demanding PC games that I've ever launched on my system. So I know that some of the footage here looks framey, and it's because of the desktop capture method that I actually used, but other than that, the game actually is running at 1920 by 1200 p okay 1200 p at around 60 frames per second so it's impressive to see that this is not a game built natively for the m1 mac this is an x86 version for macs of yesteryear running through a translation layer underneath an arm processor so you're getting like a lukewarm pc to game on a good decent chunk of battery life in the multiple hours above 10 hours at this point and you're able to play a pretty impressive looking game. Now of course this is running on a $5,000 plus system so there are more cost efficient ways to play this game but you got to understand from a technical perspective we're looking at something that shouldn't run as good as this right now. Whatever Apple has done and whatever a lot of companies involved in the space are doing is running through pretty well. So that's uh, that's one thing to consider going down this road. Remember, this is an ARM processor, guys, okay? And even when I game, this is without plugging it into the battery. This is, sorry, without plugging it into the wall, without, without like, you know, hearing the fans roar like a jet. This is able to play Deus Ex for over six hours on a single charge on an actual laptop with this frame rate. It's buttery smooth and it runs really well. See, when games are designed for Mac and you can run them through Rosetta 2, the results are actually legendary, okay? They're beautiful. Borderlands 3 runs really good. League of Legends runs really good. A lot of these Mac native games run really well. So that doesn't surprise me. The M1 Max is able to give you more frames than the old M1 chip when running those same programs. So then we move on to the next real step, okay? What if you wanted to play more games than what Apple allows you? Because even with Apple, the biggest problem is, is since they don't support 32-bit applications, a large chunk of their games just don't work at all. You can't download certain Mac games because Macs don't allow you to run 32-bit applications natively on their 64-bit or M1 chips, okay? It's, it's just not compatible. Now, if you really want to expand your Mac's third eye and actually use programs and video games, again, not just relegated to video games, programs from Windows as well, you're going to need things like, for instance, Code Weaver's crossover program, which allows you to run Windows apps on Mac, Linux, or Chrome OS. You may recognize these, if you're a Linux gamer, as the guys who are sort of also putting their effort into Wine, which is how we run a lot of Windows games underneath Linux anyways. So for me, this method alone isn't the best. It's good, but the problem is is that 
when you're trying to run certain games, you'll end up actually getting some errors. Like for instance, Persona 4 Golden, I tried running underneath with crossover and it started to gain, get issues where, hey, you're, you, don't have the, you don't have the system requirements for it. And I'm pretty sure it was because the processor was causing grievances. Now, of course, games like GTA 5 run brilliantly underneath crossover. So again, you really have to get this software and try your best and pick and choose and really go through a trial and error process. And it's also to understand this isn't exactly a free product either. There's trials for the stuff, but you're going to have to pay some money. The other option is Parallels, which is the premier virtualization tool for running Windows on Mac. And not just Windows 11, but Windows 10 and 11 ARM Edition, which is something you get from the Windows Insider branch. And through the ARM Edition, now here's the wild stuff, you actually run a game underneath Windows 11 ARM through a, their own software translation layer, something Microsoft wrote, and then virtualize the entire thing underneath Parallels on an M1 Mac. So you're going through layers of virtualization that you probably shouldn't to run games. And in certain cases, the results are actually a lot better than you can expect. Some games do work pretty well, like Yakuza Kiwami 2, uh, which ran better than the last time we touched it on this processor. And again, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have more RAM tossing at this system, and it generally is a faster, more capable device. But if you do want a game on a Mac, these are going to be things that are required. For instance, I can't play Cyberpunk Valhalla Bartending Simulator on an M1 Mac native. Through Parallels, I can virtualize the Windows version with no, with, with just no frame issues. It just works out of the box. Again, your mileage varies. Some games work underneath one method and they don't work underneath the other method. So you're going to have to pick and choose. Again, neither of these are free software. So you're going to have to play around with a free trial and when push comes to shove you're probably going to have to end up paying again this won't be the reality going down in the future i'm sure some free alternatives will kick up but right now you got to pay on top of the already absurd premium on these laptops anyways so this is where i moved into games like grand theft auto 5 yeah, Grand Theft Auto V is a pretty demanding game. It's a good port, it's a good looking game, but I was wondering, can I play this game on an M1 Max? And ladies and gentlemen, believe it or not, I'm able to get over 60 frames per second on an actual MacBook at over 1080p running through crossover. And in, the, and in regards, the actual results are quite beautiful. GTA V runs relatively well. There's no issue that I've had going on with the game. It even connects to the online infrastructure so far. Of course, I only played the game for about an hour, until I realized that the issues that are present are rather hilarious. For instance, on the M1 Max, when you're running it through crossover, the, you know, translation method, it turns out that the game's foliage does not load when you get closer. So if you drive near trees or shrubbery, they just disappear. From a distance, they render in. I think something to do with the lotting issues cause it so that certain tree effects or like leaves just stop rendering as you get close. So a real fun thing you can do is go towards Polito Bay, the north end of the map, and just walk through the forest. On the PC, you'll actually see trees everywhere. On the M1 Max, with the actual, you know, translation running through, the translation just don't render the leaves up close. That's a pretty funny thing. But for the most part, you can actually play GTA 5 single player without really any issue. It runs fine and it runs better than I ever expected. Again, this is GTA 5 running at over 60 frames per second on a system where the fans still refuse to ramp up during the playing of this game. And it runs for hours, so it's a weird situation that I've gotten myself into. The hardware seems to be capable. The only issue now is the software. So let's go down the rabbit hole even more. So I tried a few more games in this case through this method, and it turns out I started to have some issues trying to get these games to run. For instance, Persona is a good example. Persona 5, or sorry, Persona 4 Golden released on Steam. It's not a demanding game, it's a port of a Vita title. But trying to run it underneath crossover gave me an issue. It said my system did not meet minimum system requirements. So I assume this has something to do with the fact that the processor literally isn't compatible, and also the fact that the GPU isn't even recognized whatsoever. However, this is when I started switching to something called Parallels. So using this, I was actually able to get Persona 4 Golden up and running. 
But here's another issue. It's not that the hardware is incapable. It's just that because of this weird daisy chaining of software, the game barely is running. In certain cases, it loads up just fine enough, but it takes 10 minutes to get it to boot. The animations are all over the place, and it lags when there's more than two characters on the screen. Is it a playable experience? Yes, if you like pulling your fucking teeth out. But would I recommend it? No. So interestingly, at this point, we're on a same system that can run GTA 5 at above 60 frames per second, but takes over 60 minutes to properly load and play through the intro section of Persona 4 Golden. And that is if you're also skipping through the copious amounts of dialogue. So yes, this is a situation we're getting into. And why is it? Well, it's because this is a different CPU architecture. It's not that it's not capable of it, it's just it's going through so many translation layers and virtualization layers that yes, you get a degrade you get a degraded performance, but you also get a situation where the software just isn't able to translate everything and nobody can fix it. Apple is not willing to make the ultimate gaming system ever, unless you're playing games like Flappy Bird, okay? And Microsoft is developing this, but they really don't in order to get this to work, we are now at the hands of Microsoft to get their software together. And it's running on the best use case ever. It's running on the M1 Max, arguably the best ARM system for a Microsoft OS at this point in time. Now, in the older systems for Macs, you could use things like Boot Camp and install Windows natively. At the moment, you really can't do that, so you're kind of locked behind virtualization. So let's do a bit of a gaming gauntlet just to show you guys the amount of stuff that I've been testing over the while. So Mass Effect 1, or sorry, Mass Effect Legendary Edition, I only played one, runs relatively well underneath Parallels. So there is a bit of stuttering, and I found that usually when you start up a game, like five to ten minutes of stuttering is expected, but after that it completely completely smooths itself out. I don't know if that's like a shader cache being made or something of the sort, but generally it gets smoother the longer the load goes on. Then I played some Monster Hunter World, which ran at low settings, and you can play it, like you can do a hunt, but I wouldn't say that this is the ideal way to play the game. You also have uh, games like Assassin's Creed Origins, which loads up underneath virtualization, and this kind of blew my mind a little bit. In the white room, which is the loading room in the entire game, you can actually run around just fine. But as soon as you load up into the actual world, it drops to like two to three frames, which shows me that it's not the GPU that's the issue, it's not even the CPU. It might just be the software that's used to translate this on the fly. This game is just too complex. And then you end up getting into Metal Gear Solid 5 Phantom Pain, which plays absolutely beautifully underneath the M1 right here. So if you wanted to run this through virtualization, Parallels, it absolutely is there. You can play the whole game from start to finish as far as I've been able to see. Fortnite runs really well natively on the M1 itself uh, through Rosetta 2 because it's still a x86 Mac game. Then you also have Deus Ex Human Revolution, and we might as well just include the entire Deus Ex franchise as playable on this set of uh, systems. The other big thing is good old-fashioned GTA Vice City Remastered, which runs absolutely terrible. But none of us should be that surprised. Yakuza 7 fails to actually load up because we don't even meet up to its... CPU standards. Then you have Cyberpunk Valhalla Bartending Simulator, but then most importantly to finish it all off, we have Shenmue 3. So if you wanted to have some actual sleep medication installed onto your system, it's completely possible through virtualization as well. All of these games run with varying frame rates, but at least they're playable above 1200p, which may I remind you on a mobile chip is quite impressive. But, again, the biggest bottlenecks here isn't really the hardware, but rather the software translation and the daisy-chaining we have to go through to even make this possible. I then loaded up games like Dark Souls, and I came across what really baffles me real quick. Dark Souls is one of those games that I tried running first under crossover. It ran at around 4 frames per second. There are videos on YouTube of people playing this game at like 30 to 40 frames. I have never been able to achieve that yet in my term, so clearly I might be doing something wrong. But then I ran it through Parallels Virtualization, and it ran better than Crossover. 
but the game's visual effects weren't rendering properly. So unless you're willing to play with, like, this weird monstrosity, go for it, King. Do what you can. If your goal is to game on these systems, buy a gaming laptop, okay? I, I find value in this from a creative work perspective. If I bought this for gaming reasons, again... I'd be sorely disappointed. It's cool that the system can run those games, but Mac gaming, while it's kind of getting better, <laughs> unfortunately, the systems that are present aren't able to, like, hit the stride yet. Now, a lot alongside all these big, fancy, schmancy games, I found, though, true limitations. See, running games like Call of Duty Warzone, something like Cyberpunk 2077, basically modern games that require things like DirectX 12, just aren't gonna work at all. And the reason they don't work at all is because those that graphic API isn't represented in crossover or parallel. So again, the software isn't there. There's nothing really on the hard hardware end that specifically says it can't do it. It's just the software isn't there to either emulate that or let it run. The other big problem is anti-cheat. So let's say you play a lot of big popular online shooters, stuff like Valorant, stuff like Halo Infinite, stuff like Call of Duty Warzone, stuff like Rainbow Six Siege, basically any online game with an anti-cheat. This will not support it at all. You can't run anti-cheats at all with crossover, as far as my experience goes, and under Parallels vir Virtualization, the game Games don't even run at all, whether it's due to like a missing graphical effect or the fact that anti-cheats do not support virtual machines whatsoever. And you might be able to spoof them on Linux, but you can't spoof them on the way that Parallels is doing it. It's a different hypervisor. Maybe you can. Up until this point, I have not figured it out. So if you're trying to buy this and you're thinking, maybe I can get a hot, spicy match of Rainbow Six Siege done. No! And, you know, ladies and gentlemen, one more thing is cloud gaming, okay? There's been a lot of people, a lot of clickbait I found on the internet where it's like, Cyberpunk 2077 running on a MacBook. You click on the video and they're running it through Google Stadia. Look, that does not count, okay? Your grandma's vibrator can run Stadia games. It can run xCloud games. It could run anything on live. You call it. Cloud gaming does not matter. On that note, though, I did load up Rainbow Six Siege on Stadia, and it works well. Would I like to play Rainbow Six with its intricate requirement of pixel perfect aim on a cloud server? No. But if you wanted to run something like Cyberpunk 2077, look, Stadia is not a bad choice. But at that point, you also don't need to buy a $5,000 plus laptop to run Cyberpunk, okay? You can just buy a $40 Chromecast if Stadia was your option. Or buy a console at this point. I mean, that's also impossible. Who knows? Buying a graphic card is also impossible, too. So, hey, maybe Stadia is the best goddamn option, okay? But then we move on to the next big step, emulation. Now, last time I covered M1, the emulation was really impressive. So one of the first things I wanted to look at emulation-wise was PCSX2 actually does have a bunch of people on GitHub basically creating macOS builds of it that you can download and run directly underneath M1 like this, okay? And it's very simple, very easy to do. And also for Dolphin, you can go right to their website, download for Mac, and again, run it through Rosetta 2. And the actual uh, quality you got out of it is pretty decent. But a a standout piece of software that I really wanted to showcase was something called Open Emu, which might possibly be the best front end for any of the stuff that I've ever seen, better than RetroArch or whatever, and it's completely Mac exclusive as far as I know. So you can run Atari games, Lynx, ColecoVision, Game Boy, Game Gear, Game Boy Advance, all the way up to like PSP, PlayStation 1, some GameCube, and it's as easy as clicking on anything and just hitting resume uh, just to load up a prior save state and playing the game as you once originally did. And and you can quit them off right there. For instance, when it comes to something like Super Nintendo, I can fire up Final Fantasy 3, hitting resume, and playing it just as I once did. And it's pretty decent. Like, the actual gaming performance you get out of this is about as well as you can expect it. This is a powerful piece of hardware. Of course, these games shouldn't have an issue. It'll just rip right through. When you look at something like Game Boy Advance, for instance, right here, you can see that I've got a bunch of titles. I mean, I've even got Shrek 2 the movie. It's reported wrong, but if I wanted to play something like Shin Megami Tensei, you know, English patch, I'm completely able to do so with ease. And again, I have to reiterate, this is the best front end for emulation. Now, of course, if you go above anything like RPCS3, that's not going to happen simply due to the fact that that's a very, very, very alpha build emulator, and it's specifically designed to run on x86. You're not going to get it running on ARM systems. 
And that's really the caveat, okay? Those higher-end emulators like CMU, RPCS3, Xenia, they're not going to work as you would expect. If emulation is your game and key, and that's where you get most of your gaming done, flawless system to have, okay? Overly expensive for that, but it works just as you would expect on a five grand plus system. So what I've learned today in my gaming adventure is that MacBook Pros, the new MacBook processors are actually pretty good from a hardware perspective. Apple might have actually made what is one of the most interesting potential gaming laptops out in the market. The only problem is the software isn't there. Apple also doesn't really seem to have an interest in pushing the gaming ad avenue, even though they probably should. I don't know, maybe two years down the road, Apple could be putting their big boy bucks, their war chest, into a bunch of massive developers and getting ports for their, pro for, for the, for their hardware. They probably could. Mac gamers outweigh us Linux gamers. And if Apple is willing to put in the same work that Valve is for the Steam Deck... Apple could seriously be a good contender for gaming. Again, it's if Apple wants to do it. The hardware that's already present relies on a bunch of other companies, Parallels, Crossover, and Microsoft, to keep up to date and provide further enhancements, because without them, the gaming that we're already able to jerry-rig together could potentially stay at a standstill. So yes, point is, if you're a Mac gamer, your options on their new hardware look pretty interesting. How far your mileage may go is entirely dependent on the companies that that are building and designing the software and hardware for your massively expensive laptop or desktop in the future. That's the world that we're looking into. It's a laptop that if, if built properly in all regards for gaming is something that'll last you longer than any gaming laptop I know, run cooler than any gaming laptop I know, and probably provide you a better experience overall than any gaming laptop I know. But that's, of course, entirely dependent on if every company gets in bed together or if Apple gets their shit together and pushes gaming the right way. But I, I, I think it's easier for me personally to go to the moon before that ever happens. But that's a whole different story, okay? With that said, though, I think this is a rather interesting area that Apple is going down into. In the past, I've always shit on this company for releasing, in my opinion, subpar laptops with a massive Apple tax behind them. And it's really up until now with the M1 Max that while, yes, they are expensive, I have to give Apple some credit into actually designing their own hardware through and through. And they did not half-ass it this time. As far as using this for the intended reasons Apple wants you to use, whether it's for work, programming, or things like creative video production, it's there. It works, and it does a pretty damn good job at it. Apple clearly didn't think about gaming, but you knew people like me were going to get into this to game a little bit, and our results are interesting. Look, it's not impressive to most people, okay? You're probably looking at this video and saying, ha, Muda, you burned $5,000 to play Yakuza Kiwami 2 at 20 frames per second, and you're right, I, I did, okay? But the, the intention for me to get this laptop wasn't a game. I clearly have a gaming laptop. I have consoles. This wasn't meant to be a gaming device, but it's rather interesting to see that it could even handle that level of gaming at all on this device. And you know what? At the end of the day, I don't give a fuck what any of you say. This thing can run Shenmue 1, 2, and 3 all the way through. So if I wanted to use it as a fucking sleeping aid, I absolutely 100% could, okay? And you know, I don't need any more justification than that, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, today I spent $5,000 plus to game on a Mac. Did I succeed? Yes. Uh, should I I succeeded? Probably not. Was it worth the success? Definitely not. But you know what? I hope you enjoyed this video, and I honestly hope you learned something about architecture sets, processors, and frankly, what could be emergingly cool technology down in the future. This is me, Mudahar, and if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike it if you dislike it. I am out.